why this is blue. All right, we have, uh, uh, we're on the next section, raw echelon form. We will uh, look at an example that we had in the back or before and just show you what it means to, to be in row echelon form. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use this as an example and then we'll throw all the vocabulary out to you so that you would know what I mean when I'm talking about row echelon form. So let's start off by looking at this example, uh, which is a system of linear equations. And what we're going to do uh, towards the end of the last section, we should have tried to transpose this into a matrix, but we'll do it now. What we're going to do is create what's called a matrix of coefficients. Because if we're looking at these uh, equations, We're looking at these equations, the only thing that really stands out as important are the coefficients and including the constants on the other side. And so the x1 and x2 are kind of built into our system and we probably don't need to consider that. And so what we want to do is we just want to get those coefficients and make what's called the coefficients of matrix or matrix of coefficients. And so we have 2, 4, 5, and 7. Now the left hand side and then uh, when we have the right hand side we kind of that's kind of like a special attachment to this matrix and we'll see what I mean by special attachment maybe by the end of this class we'll get to 1.3 and so we usually denote the attachment by a dotted line sometimes we don't use a dotted line at all and just consider the whole matrix but uh, sometimes we do and so we have uh, a matrix of coefficients with the right-hand side included. And so that's the augmented portion. And then if you remember the way we saw for this, we used some sort of addition law. And uh, one way we did this was to eliminate the x1. And we did that by, say, multiplying the first equation by 5 and multiplying the second equation by negative 2 or something. Uh, but instead of doing that, I kind of suggested, why don't we just not touch the top equation and mess around with the second equation? And we ended up multiplying it by, do you remember what it was? Two-fifths or five-halves? I don't know, one of those. <laughs> Which one? <clears throat> two-fifths, so we multiplied the, the bottom equation by two-fifths or negative two-fifths. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a move um, called an elementary row operation. And we're going to denote an elementary row operation by an arrow. I guess I'll keep this. And just the way I like to do my notation is, is I do it with an arrow, and then on top of the arrow, I write what I'm going to do in my next step. And so what I'm going to do in my next step is I'm going to take row 2 and multiply row 2 by, what is it, 2 fifths? Probably negative 2 fifths. And then I'll add it to row 1. Now, I, leave, I usually leave this out, but for the first couple, I'll, I'll write it here. And I'll say I'll replace, and I'll do that with another arrow. Replace row 1. And so I'm going to get a new matrix. So the new matrix that I'm going to get is... Uh, I'm sorry, this is replacing row 2, R2. So the new matrix that I'm going to get will have the same first row, but then the second row is changed. And the second row is going to change by um, getting a 0. 
for the first one because that's the whole point, right? We got it to be zero and uh, whatever else happened, I'm gonna go cheat and look back in our previous page of notes. Uh, six fifths x2 and negative 42 over five. So six fifths, negative 42 over five. Okay, so what we did here was called uh, an elementary row operation. <laughs> and then what we've accomplished here is we got this thing to have a zero in this spot. And so if we rewrite this matrix back into the system, we can see that that system will have a 2x1 plus 4x2 is equal to negative 4. And now I have a 0x1 plus 6 fifths x2 is equal to negative 42 over 5, which is what we had in our previous page. Okay. All right. So this matrix that we have is called a uh, matrix in in row echelon form, and we'll be specific about what the row echelon form actually is. Okay. All right, let's take a look at um, some definitions. Actually, we might need to talk about the matrix notation, matrix coefficients, and stuff like that. So let me let me add these into our into our notes. All right, so what we did was we took the coefficients of the system and made it into a rectangular array called the matrix. And the coefficient matrix uh, is going to be a two-dimensional array of coefficients. And the augmented portion of it is when we include the right-hand side of the system as the last column. Uh, the size of the matrix tells you how many rows and columns it has. Uh, the matrix of size M by N has M rows. So the rows always come first and the columns come second. So when we're looking at matrices, we'll see, we'll read it as the number of rows by the number of columns. And then here are the elementary row operations that I was talking about. Um, one elementary row operation is to replace one row by the sum of itself and a multiple of another row. So that's the row operation that we actually did. A second row operation is to interchange two rows, which we can do if we have if we only have two of them, interchanging them isn't really going to help very much, but sometimes it might. And then the last uh, elementary row operation is scaling. That's to multiply uh, one whole row, just the row, not everything, but just the row is multiply each entries in a row by some number. All right. So again, with a simple two by two or simple two equations and two unknowns, it's really not much work to do. But when we get to larger systems, like when we have uh, five equations and five unknowns, then it's a little trickier, so these uh, matrices will come in a lot more uh, useful for us. Any questions?
Yes. Uh, well, interchange means you switch the row. So our our example here was uh, let's say this is our example. So another row operation. Two, four, negative four, five, seven, eleven. What is it? Five, seven, seven. So we can um, interchange row one and row two. And this is usually my notation for that. And all that's going to do is switch, um, switch the two rows. 5, 7, 11, 2, 4, negative 4. So it seems pointless, but in some cases that might be an important move to do. Yeah? Uh, I think for the first few times, uh, whether that's going to be on the test or in the quiz, uh, then it would be good for you to show all the steps. There might be some cases where you can include two steps at once, but in general, I'd like to see the steps that you got. So uh, this is an example of the second type of row operation. This is an example of third type of row operation. You have 2, 4, negative 4, 5, 7, 11. And say for some reason you just want to multiply the first row by negative 5 and then replace the first row by that. So that would be um, scaling. So this would be negative 10, negative 20, positive 20. Well, what did we do? So we took row. Uh huh. Oh, we're. I think we're supposed to do it the other way. I don't know if this is correct. Good eye. I think what we did here is we multiplied the first row by negative five halves. So we multiplied the first row by negative five halves. And then we added the second row. And then we replaced the second row. Two fifths. Is it five halves? Yeah. So we multiplied the first row by five halves. So this becomes negative five and then added to the second row, and that gave you us that gave us zero. We multiplied four by negative five halves. We're going to get negative twenty over two. All right, so we multiply this by um, negative 5 halves, and you get negative 20 over 2. And then we add it to 7. What is that? Wait, 5 halves times 4.
So it's negative 3. So this should be negative 3. And then we multiply this negative 4 by negative 5 halves. So that's positive 20 over 2 plus 11. What's that? 21. So our new system should have been negative 3 I don't know. Was it wrong? No, so I think what we did was we did a different kind of operation that wasn't really denoted as an elementary row operation. So we did some other combination of something. Well, now that we got this, we probably should check to make sure it's going to give us the right answer, huh? Matt? Hold on, hold on. Matt? So we did come up with the same answer. OK. Yeah. So I think what happened is that in the last time we did this, we didn't have our tools for elementary row operations. And so we didn't use elementary row operations. But we kind of did, I think. What we did was a, a different combination of elementary row operations. And that's how we got the answer that we got. So it's, it's a little bit different but we should get the same result. And maybe you should think about what, if you go back to yesterday's or Wednesday's notes, you can try to figure out what exactly the elementary row operations we took to get the result. Pedro, you can say something? So x2 equals negative 7. And then you put that in there, you get x1 equals 12. Is that what we got last time? <clears throat> yeah, so that's what we got last time. So we just did it a little bit differently. And like I said, this thing involves, what we did last time involves some sort of different combination of, of uh, elementary row operations. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on, on the person, I think. All right, so that's, uh, that's some information about Elementary row operations, and now what we want to do is we want to get to where we are, which is to have that zero there as something useful for us, and that's what um, row echelon is. Matt. I think you should specifically use the elementary row operation. And so it has to follow one of these three steps. You either uh, so the thing about this is what Alan pointed out is that you're supposed to get another equation, multiply that other equation by something, and then add it to the current, equa current equation that you're working with. Or I guess we're looking at rows here. You're looking at multiplying one of the rows by something and add it to that current row that you're working with. And that row that you're working with is the row that you're going to change. Okay. I want us to use one of the, these three steps anytime we're making a, a move in our matrix. So like I said, what we did last time is probably a, a different combination of these three steps. And people can do things a little bit differently as they're working, as long as you're following these rules 
for these particular steps, then I think it'll be okay. Yeah. I think the only difference I've found is how we scale uh, row two, then a row, row one. We scaled that first? Yes. So yeah. Uh, negative two over five. And then we added. Right. So that'd be the step one. Yeah. So we did, so it sounds like we did step three, and then we did step one, and then that's what we got. Yeah. Think about that. The difference between doing that and what we just did today. All right, let's uh, move on to <clears throat> row echelon form. I'll put the definition and we'll take a look at an example. So a uh, matrix is going to be in row echelon form if it has the following three properties. So it starts off with three properties. Uh, all non-zero rows are above any rows that are all zeros. So with our simple example, we didn't have a case where we had a bunch of non-zero rows. So uh, some cases that might happen. So that's why it's defined here. So we want all the zeros in the bottom and we want all the non-zeros on top. Uh, the second criteria, each leading entry in a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. <laughs> a leading entry of a row refers to the leftmost non-zero entry. And then all entries in a column below, a leading entry are zeros. So let's take a look at our example that we had reduced already. And I think it was uh, two, four, negative four, and then zero, negative three, and 21. So the first criteria says that uh, all non-zero rows are above any of all zeros, any rows of all zeros. So we don't have any rows of all zeros, so that doesn't apply. Okay. Uh, so number two, each leading entry of a row is in a column to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. So the leading entry of this first row is two. And it's to the right of the leading, there's no row above it, so let's not worry about that row. Let's take a look at the leading entry in the second row, negative three. The leading entry of the second row is to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. So the leading entry of the row above the second row is two, and the leading entry of our row that we're looking at is to the right of the leading entry of the first row. The row above it. And then all entries in a column below a leading entry are zeros. So there's nothing below the second row, but the first row below it is zero. So below the leading entry is zero. Okay, so the three conditions are satisfied, and in general, what we want. is to have zeros on the bottom left corner of your matrix. Now, with only two rows, it doesn't really tell us very much, but we'll see more examples with more rows. So that's row echelon form. Now, if you satisfy those three things, and then you have two other conditions, where the leading entry in each non-zero entry is one, and each leading one is the only non-zero entry in its column. Does that work for what we have? No, 
right? So we have an issue already with the number four here. The leading entry in each non-zero entry is one. So the leading entry in our in our first row is two. So let's do an elementary row operation. to make sure that the leading entry in the first row is one. So what's our, what's our row operation to get this to be one? We scale it, so we divide by two or multiply by a half. Right? So that would scale the first row to one, two, negative two, zero, minus three, 21. Does that satisfy the condition number four? Well, the leading entry in each non-zero entry is one. So we have the leading entry for this. We have two leading entries though, right? So we need to, we need to fix up the second row as well. So let's do that. What do we need to do to fix up the second row to make it satisfy four? So divide by negative three, let's say we're gonna multiply by negative one third, uh, multiply that in row two to replace row two. So we get one and we get negative seven. Yes. It has to be positive one. Okay, so number four looks like it's satisfied. The leading entry in each non-zero entry is one. Should be non-zero row. So number four satisfies. Number five satisfied? Each leading one in non-zero entry, each leading one is the only non-zero entry in its column. So the first column, I have a leading one and I have a zero down there, so that's good. But the second column, I have a leading one in the second row, but the number above it is not zero, so I need to make that into a zero. How can I make that into a zero? Yeah. So I multiply the bottom row by negative two, and then I add it to the first row, and I'll replace the first row. So what do I get? I get one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the second row first because I didn't change that. And so now the move, I multiply the, the second row by negative two. So that doesn't change the first non-zero element up there. And here I multiply this by negative two, and I get a zero, right? And so now I multiply negative seven by negative two, that's negative positive 14, right? Positive 14 minus two is positive 12. Now, number four and number five are satisfied. So now we must be in reduced row oh, echelon form. Yes. Well, remember that this came from a system of linear equations. Right, and so if we rewrite this back into our system of linear equations and pretend that these ones and zeros are just coefficients, then what do we have? We have one times x1 plus zero times x2 is equal to 12. Zero times x1 plus one times x2 is equal to negative seven. And what is that? 
that's our answer, right? X1 is equal to 12, X2 is equal to minus 7. So the reduced row echelon form actually hand delivers us the answers to our system. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, if it's not consistent, then some other funny things will happen, and we'll figure out how what those are. And in algebra, we've dealt with inconsistent systems. And what happens is that uh, when you try to combine a couple of things, we're going to get you know a number is equal to another number that's not equal to that other number, and so we get a uh, what's that called? Oh, there's an official philosophy logic term for it. When you get a false statement in the end. Contradiction. Contradiction? A what? Fallacy? Fallacy, yeah. Tautology and fallacy. You get a false statement. Contradiction would be a good word for that, too. All right. <clears throat> So we'll, we'll see an example like that, maybe. Questions about um, row echelon and reduced row echelon form? Yes. In reduced row echelon form, yes. And reduced row echelon form usually would give us our actual answer to, to the, the system if it's consistent. Maybe you're tired of doing row operations and you can, because at, at this step in row echelon form, we were able to solve for the system already, right? And so sometimes you just want to solve for it and then you going through some more row operations might be more hit, more of a headache than solving for it right away. And we're kind of doing the same amount of work. Let's get Pedro first and I'll go back. You should be able to see that there. You get your fallacy, your contradiction there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I can switch the order of the rows, like in the in row interchange, but I, it's not going to help me. I mean. Um, I don't know if it makes sense, but in general, the row echelon form, you want it to be this form. So you want the zeros on the lower left-hand corner. Um, according to this definition, yes. You can, I mean, mathematically, you can still work with it with the zeros up on top if you want, but um, mathematically, we like to keep it this way. Uh, you had a question. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's kind of like what we did up here when we did it yesterday or on on Wednesday last week. And so we stopped and we didn't go all the way to reduced and then we did, we were still able to solve for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. No, well, X1 and X2 are like the, the original variables that we were working with in the system. So we can call it X and Y or X, Y, Z if there's three of them. But that's just, uh, those are the variables that we were supposedly trying to solve in the beginning. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. 
Uh, you'll see you'll, uh, you'll see something like nine is equal to fifteen or something. Yeah. All right. Let's. Uh, there's some uh, other theory stuff here that we can put up before we do our example. I kind of like to get it out of the way. Let's let's talk about the existence and unique or the uniqueness of the reduced row echelon form. Um, each matrix is equivalent to one and only one reduced row echelon form. Now, when you do the regular reduction and you don't go all the way to the reduced row echelon form, when you just go to the regular row echelon form, many people can have different answers for that. But when you go all the way to reduce row echelon form with the zeros and ones, then there can only be one answer for that. So that's what this uniqueness is saying. And I want to highlight or circle the reduced row echelon form because when you're doing this and you're just doing regular row echelon form, then you may not you may have a different answer from somebody else, and that will be okay. It's when you go all the way to the reduced row echelon form where there's only one. Uh, there are many ways to get a matrix in row echelon, but there's only one row reduced. And uh, here they talk about pivot positions. And so as we're doing the row reduction, we're going to be talking about pivots. So a pivot position. In matrix A is a location in A that corresponds to a leading one in the reduced row echelon form. Even if you're not all the way to reduced row echelon form, if you're just in regular row echelon form, you can identify the pivot position. A pivot column is a column in A that contains a pivot position. And a pivot is non-zero number in a pivot position that you use uh, as needed to create zeros in your other rows in that same column. Okay, so if you just want to kind of soak this in for a moment and then let's take a look at an example and, uh, and identify these vocabulary words and see how they fit in. Let's use the example that I have here. And before we get to the solutions, why don't you spend about five minutes working on your own to see if you can if you can come up with a with the results in row echelon form <clears throat> So let's say I want to I think I need a longer arrow I want to uh, multiply the first row by one and add it to the third row and replace the third row. <clears throat> so that means everything else will stay the same. I have one, negative seven, zero, six, and five stays the same. And then the second row stays the same. So this is the one that's gonna change. So I just simply add the first and, and third row, each of those elements, and I get zero and zero, which is uh, the interesting, nice thing that I got uh, in my second observation. And then I add one and four, I get five, and I add these two, I get zero again, and I add those two, I get four. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Was there something else? Oh, <laughs> the second row. Boy. Must have been really testing you out. All right, let's try this again. 
So I'm adding the, the first row and the second. So this is negative four. And then six and two is eight. Yeah. And then five and seven is 12. That work? Okay. <clears throat> so now um, I have this matrix and now I have zeros on these corners and I think the next thing I want to make equal to zero is this uh, negative four here. See if we can make that zero and I'll use the second row because it has a pivot. <laughs> and then multiply that by four. So I'll take uh, the second row, multiply this by positive four and then add it to the third row. and replace the third row. So the first and second rows don't change. And now, um, when you do these elementary row operations on your way to making it a uh, row echelon form, if there are zeros, and if you're doing the right move, if there are zeros on the left-hand side of your pivot columns, then it's going to stay zeros. It should. Otherwise, you might have done something wrong. So this is still a 0, 0. And now the 1 uh, minus uh, positive 4 times 1 and add it to negative 4 is 0. So 4 and negative 2 is negative 8. Add to 8, that's 0 again. And 3, negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. Add 12 to zeros. I get a whole row of zeros. So this is in row echelon form. Question, is this in reduced row echelon form? What, what do we need to do to make it in reduced row echelon form? A couple people said no. I mean, a couple people said yes. So which one is it? If it's no, then what do I have to do to make it into a reduced row echelon form? Yeah. Can you make that negative seven disappear? Andrew? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it was really specific about that. Well, it says that below it, the, the next lead, not leading non-zero is to the right of the leading above it, but it, it, yeah, by any amount. So that was good clarification on the criteria. Luis? So I think it is in row echelon form. And let's take a look at the criteria again. In reduced row echelon form. So uh, first of all, it is in regular row echelon form. And second of all, it's in reduced row echelon form because a leading entry in each non-zero row, we should, we should put row here. Sorry, if you need to look back in your notes. Um, is one, and then the leading uh, each leading one is the only non-zero entry in its column. So Luis described it. Uh, the leading entries are one, and then each for each leading entry, all the rest of the numbers in the same column are zeros. The negative seven here is there's not much you can do about that. In fact, you can't. Do anything about that. You can't make it into a zero because you need to multiply it by something to make that into a zero, and that's that's not going to work. So it it follows our regular row echelon form. It has zeros on the lower corner, lower left corner of the matrix, and it's reduced row echelon form because all the leading entries are one, and and zeros for those other leading entries. So um, in terms of Columns, let's call it column one, two, three, and four. Uh, column five doesn't count because that's the, that's the right-hand side of your system. 
So between columns 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are the pivot columns? 1 and 3, right? So the pivot columns, the column of A that contains a pivot position, the pivot position are those positions where you have 1s as a leading entry. So we have pivot columns in 1 and 3. A pivot is a non-zero number and a pivot position used to create zero. So uh, we didn't have to do it in this case, but if this were non-zero, then we would have had to use our pivot to, to make that into a zero. But in this case, we didn't have to do that. All right. So <clears throat> now, if we were to look at this in reduced row echelon form, we should have the solution to the system. So the solution to the system, uh, or the way to describe the solution to the system is kind of like that last thing that we did on Wednesday where I said, think about it. And I don't know if anybody thought about it and how you re represent it, but let's, let's take a look at this because this is a good example. And it's a, lot, a little bit more complicated than that first one, but uh, if we can understand it, then we can get a good feel for how to express a solution. <clears throat> so we can grab the solutions from here, but let's first write out uh, what we think this, this is going to be. Uh, if I look at the matrix and write it as a system again, I would have 1 times x1 uh, minus 7x2 plus 0x3 plus 6x4 equal to 5, and I'll use spaces, unlike the way the problem is written, uh, to represent all those columns. So the next one is uh, x3 minus 2x4 is equal to negative 3. And then the last one, there's nothing there. And so I just have a bunch of zeros. So my system that start off with three equations kind of got reduced to now a system of two equations, and I'm supposed to try to find a solution to this. What is a solution again? A solution is a collection of values for your variables. In this case, I have four variables. So a solution would be the numbers that I can put in for x1, x2, x3, and x4 that would make this a true statement. Kind of shot in the dark, but is there anything we can put for x1, x2, x3, and x4 just by looking at it to see if you can make this work? Like actual numbers, yeah. I think if we only had two equations, it probably would have been easy enough to figure out. But now we have two variables. But now we have four variables, yeah? <clears throat> Let's see if that works. So for the first equation, you get 5 minus 7 times 0 uh, plus 6 times 0 is equal to 5. That works, right? Those zeros really help out. And then the next one, I have 3. Let's make that into a negative 3 uh, minus 2 times 0 is equal to negative 3. And that also works out. So that's a that's an interesting move. Setting x two and x four equal to zero. How did you how did you think of that? So it looks like x one and x three kind of depend on x2 and x4, and x2 and x4 seems like it could be anything. <laughs> so they're free variables. So those columns, that, not including the augmented part, those columns that are not pivot columns are called free. So 
So in column four, when column four is, uh, is not a pivot column, we have what's called a free variable. So free means it's independent. You can make it whatever you want. And so we have another one here. The second column is not a pivot column. So that also is a free variable. So x2 and x3 or x2 and x4 are free variables which means you can let them equal to whatever you want. So Pedro let it equal to zero, but you could try putting one in for x2 and zero in for x4, and then try to solve for x1 and x3. And then you'll see that that also will be a solution. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it'll break. Uh, I think if you put one in for x4, then uh, x3 depends on x4. So you would need to solve for x3, given what you let x4 equal to. And after you have those two, you would solve for x1, given on what you had for x2 and x4, and whatever you got for x3. Yeah. So let's see, I'm out of room on this particular page. Let's see if we can do it here. <laughs> let x4 equal a one. If you let x4 equal a one, then x3 is gonna be equal to negative one. Now x2 is also free, so you're free to let that equal to whatever you want. Should we put zero or a different one? Let's put zero because it'll be easier. So x1 is equal to, so what do we say? x2 is equal to zero and x4 was equal to one. So what's x1 equal to? What is it? All right, so this is uh, positive one, uh, six, five minus six is negative one, so x1 is equal to negative one. So if you try this set of numbers, then you should also get a true statement for the system. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Well, since x1 and x3 are dependent, if you if you randomly set x1 or if you randomly set x4 equal to 1 and x3 equal to 0, that already won't work. So, you can only randomly set the free variables equal to whatever you want, but everything else will depend on the free variables. No, it won't work. Try it. I'm not going to try it. You try it. Um, <clears throat> all right. So So Louise asked if there's a, a way to express this mathematically. There is. <clears throat> but 
But before we get to the solutions, let's take a look at the steps that we took. Uh, steps for um, the satisfy criteria is one through four is called the forward phase. And then uh, criteria five, you're actually setting the zeros uh, in the column, in the pivot columns. And so they, uh, that's called back solving or backward phase. Uh, variables corresponding to the pivot columns are called basic variables or regular variables or leading variables. And uh, the variables that are in the non-pivot columns are called free variables. Free variables are free in the sense that they can take on any value that we want. Other variables are then determined by the choice of your free variables. And you can only choose the free variables to be whatever you want. And then you need to solve for the other variables. You can't randomly assign different numbers for the regular variables because you're not going to get a solution that would necessarily get a solution that would work. So if we take a look at this, we found that x4 and x3, or x4 and x2 were the three variables. And it turns out that x1 and x3 Three are dependent on the free variables and also dependent on the other variables, so uh, you would need to solve for them. So this is how you would write it mathematically. You can either write it like this, or when we get to uh, learn about vectors in the second chapter, well, we can express our, our solutions in vector form. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, we had four variables and we had three equations, and actually, the three equations just came down to two equations. Yeah. There's no guarantee. Yeah. So sometimes you might, usually in those cases, uh, it would happen more if they were randomly chosen. It would happen more that you will you will have an inconsistent system, but it could happen that you might have free variable anyway. So it all depends on the particular system. Okay. Uh, sometimes because they're free variables, we might call it a different parameter. And the parameters that we use are t, and since we need two of them, the next letter is s. So sometimes we use s and t. Wait, the letter above it is s. Whatever. So sometimes we use S and T. So we sometimes we say X4 equals T and X2 equals S. And so your solutions then would be in terms of S and T. And then so your X3 would be minus 3 plus 4T. And then your S, your X1 would be 5 minus, which one was 4? T plus 7S. So this would be your family of solutions. You'll, it's a two-parameter family of solutions because you can let two variables equal to whatever you want. And if you let S and T both equal to zero, we get the solutions that Pedro gave us. If you let uh, S equal to, uh, if you let T equal to uh, one and S equal to zero, we, we would get the other solution that we found. And it turns out that you can let them be whatever you want. And it should still work in that system. Okay. Um, so you're saying, what if we let What if we let x4 equal to, or you want to let x3 equal to something else? So if we let x3 equal to 0 and x1 equal to, Why, why 
Well, it's the non-pivot ones are free. And then the pivot ones are the ones that are dependent on the non-pivot one. Yeah. If you had something like this, then <clears throat> you have free variables in x2 and x4. And then x1 and x3 are already solved for, are defined. So in this case, they're not even dependent on the free variables. So then you have x1 is equal to 5, x3 is equal to negative 3, and then x2 and x4 can be whatever you want it to be. And it would still work in this system. So your system of equations would look like x1 is equal to 5, x3 is equal to negative 3. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, and then this says that I could put in 17 for x2 and 24 for x4, and it would still be a true statement, a true uh, system, if I know that th these are my solutions. Okay. Keep thinking about it outside of class. All right, so the last thing is um, let's talk about the existence and uniqueness theorem, how if you get a solution, then it's unique, and then let's kind of recap the procedures. Am I going to have enough room for this? Nope. Sorry, I have to add another page. So first, the existence and uniqueness. A uh, linear system is consistent if and only if the rightmost column of the augmented matrix is not a pivot column. <laughs> so that's the same thing as saying the row echelon uh, form of the augmented matrix has no rows of the form 0, 0, 0, 0, and then the augmented part is B, non-zero. So you guys were asking about, we didn't do an example of a, an inconsistent solution or, or a system that doesn't have a solution. Uh, the solu the, it doesn't have a, solu a solution if you get a contradiction. And if you take a look at a reduced row echelon form, or a row echelon form in general, if the augmented portion is non-zero, and then all your right-hand sides equal to zero, then you have zero equal to something that's non-zero, and then that's your contradiction, your fallacy, or whatever you want to call it. And that gives us uh, something where you don't have a solution. Uh, so it's inconsistent. A linear system is consistent, then the solution uh, is either unique or you have free variables and you have infinitely many solutions. So those are the three cases that we talked about. 
you can't just have five solutions and then that's it. It's either one exact, exactly one solution or infinitely many. And then here's a procedure for doing row reduction, but we've done a couple of examples already and you just have to do it on your own to practice and get used to it. So um, I'll let you read through this. These will be in the notes available in Canvas, so you can take a look at it. It's also in the book. All right, see you guys on Wednesday.